Anyway, as I was saying, you can see from the title when I talk about the existential problem of the borders, uh, this is Israel's big problem today. It's one of its two major problems. That's not, that, don't, that won't go away. Um, I don't need to tell you, just say the word Gaza Strip, you know, like, where's that going? I mean, what's the future? And if you talk about the West Bank, with Israel's uh, unbelievably narrow waist, as I know everyone here tonight is familiar with, uh, where's that going? Uh, do recall that every country in the world without exception, including the United States of America, is fully committed, and has been committed forever, to Israel going back to those borders, possibly with slight modifications, but fundamentally those borders. There's not a country in the world that doesn't subscribe to that. And, uh, and many Israelis do. Uh, and yet, we all know the borders are crazy. Uh, how did they end up that way? That's what I'm going to uh, speak about tonight, which takes me back to uh, the strange nature of the 48 war that I spoke about at length uh, last year. But even though I spoke about it, I actually barely scratched the surface. Prior to May 48th, May 14th, if you recall, uh, what Israel grabbed and held, and Israel was fighting the Palestinians. So those places it took, prior to May 14th, 48, in, uh, really in, in March, April, and, and May, uh, I'm talking about Haifa, Yaffa, Tzfas, Tveria, these are places that are not supposed to be in Israel. But they ended up there, because at that time it still belonged to Britain, where they had the mandate, and the British were pulling out, and they were in a blue funk. And the United Nations, at that point, was not okay. They weren't physically involved in what was called the Palestine situation. Oh, they were throwing their hands up with horror that fighting is broken out ever after November 29th of 47, and that's not supposed to be, and shame on you, uh, but that's all they did. After May 14th, when Israel became a state, after May 14th, as we all know, the Arab states invaded with rather small armies, as we saw last year. But what's even worse is the UN began poking its nose in the situation because the responsibility for Palestine fell to the UN because the British mandate had lapsed. Therein lies uh, the problem. As soon as Israel proclaimed independence and the Arabs invaded. That was on May 14th, May 15th of 1948. The United Nations immediately appointed Tom Bernadotte. There we go. Uh, as the official mediator, not that the Israelis or the Arabs asked for it. The United Nations, this is what we're doing. Who immediately sought to make Israel withdraw from its conquest to go back to the partition lines. He was also committed very strongly um, to bringing the Arab refugees back, whom the Israelis had expelled, as we saw this year, from places like Haifa and Yafa and places and, and, and so forth. And Bernadotte was very strongly supported in May and June and July of 48 uh, by the State Department and by the British Foreign Office. The new Israeli state therefore had to deal with two matters, two battles. Militarily, they had to fight off the Arab attacks. But politically, they also had to fight off the political attacks of the UN, and this was no joke, because the pressure did not go away. And really, from the time in, around May 20th, May 21st, 22nd, Bernadotte showed up in Tel Aviv, and already then, this is the very, very beginning of Israel. This is when the Arab Legion and the Egyptian army, they're all moving in, and the situation was militarily very desperate. And he was saying at that time, you have to commit yourselves, and then implement, to bring back all the refugees, all the Arabs that came uh, that left, and uh, second of all, you have to commit yourself to pulling out from any territory like Sfat, for example, that you've acquired, because you have to stick with the um, uh, partition lines, uh, even though they're very tiny, as we know. And Bernadotte was killed in September by Jews, but it was picked up by his deputy, Ralph Bunch, uh, the famous uh, black American who won the Nobel Prize for eventually uh, pushing the Jews and the Arabs to sign armistice agreements in, in 49, and uh, that's good and it's bad, and uh, he was a little more diplomatic than uh, Bernadotte was, who was very threatening all the time, and he says, you know, I'm going to have the, the world declare a boycott on you and sanctions and this and that and the other. It was, he was really a tough character. Uh, Bunch was more diplomatic, but he, he represented successfully, I'm sorry to say, the UN position, which was, Israel cannot take over Israel. And they have to, you know, make this concession and that concession. They have to give back land. They have to give the, take back refugees. The whole business. And so the point I'm trying to make is that all during 1948 and 49, 
During the entire period of the war, Israel was under pressure from the UN, from England, and from America not to take Arab land. Anytime they, I can't stress this uh, too much, the window of opportunity was prior to May 48 and maybe a week or 10 days after May 14. That's really, if you, if you study it closely. After that, uh, nothing was open for discussion. And anything that Israel did take, as, as you know they did, beyond the partition line, they really were pressured to tremendously give it back. And if they didn't give it back, they, they, they certainly can't take more. It was uh, really rough. In spite of this, the Jews did conquer some Arab land. Notice, by the way, the Palestinians were not part of the discussion. They were completely sidelined by the Arab states who had invaded Palestine. The utter, defeat. the utter defeat of the Palestinians in the earlier fighting, in other words, you remember this, I know just about everybody that I'm looking at was here last year. Um, the, 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 as far as the Palestinians are concerned, they were completely defeated in March, April, and May of 48. Uh, the Haganah, the Palmach, and all this had gone on the offensive, and they couldn't stop them. I mean, if, if it was just them, uh, the Jews would, would, would fairly easily take over the whole of Eretz Yisro. Uh, and because of that, the other Arabs regarded the Palestinians as contemptible. And so they were not factors. But the other Arab states, they had to be negotiated with when it came to deciding which lands that the Jews would take. So if Israel's going to be fighting, as they do, over the political question of who ends up with the Negev, it will not be with the Mufti, who's the leader of the Palestinians, or some other guy like that. They don't count. But it will be with Egypt, for example, or with Jordan. And you might say, as they were entitled to say, what tax has Egypt got to do with this? It's not part of Egypt. What does Jordan have to do? It's not part of Jordan either. It's another country. In spite of that fact, there was big pressure, the Arab states and the UN, which was, as I said, at this particular moment, under the unfriendly influence of the British Foreign Office and the US State Department, that's what it was, um, they were backing the Arab side in saying that Israel indeed ought to uh, give up the Negev, for example, or other territories, um, to other countries, other Arab states. Uh, I know you've never, probably never heard of these guys. That's my point. Uh, this guy was, but, but, but they weren't unimportant. This guy was the number one bureaucrat in the British Foreign Office, and this guy at that time was the Under Secretary of State. He was the number one bureaucrat in the State Department. The faceless people that most people have never heard of are the ones that actually do most of the work and had the influence at this particular time. Uh, there is a difference between uh, up to November of 48 and afterwards because there was an election going on in America. But once the election was over and Truman won, even though Truman was supposed to be friendly to Israel, then the, uh, these two guys could and did cooperate very closely. I'm sorry to say that the State Department almost totally backed the British position and the loser was Israel. So you end up having a very complicated triangle. You know, it's the Arabs, it's the State Department, it's uh, Israel and, uh, you know, uh, the, this particular country and that particular country. It's a military battle, it's a political struggle going on at that time. And these are the two Israeli leaders, as you know, Ben-Gurion being, of course, the, the Prime Minister and the Defense Minister, the guy in charge of the army, and Moshe Sharet was number two. He was the Foreign Minister, very famous person. Maybe there are people who don't even know about him, but in his day, he was number two to Ben-Gurion. And, of course, he is mainly interested in the military struggle, and he's got to bear the burden of the political struggle. You understand? And he's the, I mean, just imagine that Israel every day is getting notes and telegrams and formal letters and that kind of thing from the United States and from the UN and from England and from this one and from that one saying you have to do this, you can't do this, you have to give this back, this was illegal that you did, and all the rest of it. And it was uh, no joke. As a matter of fact, political battles uh, have greater consequences sometimes than military ones uh, because uh, the military depends on who wins in the battlefield. The political one, uh, the other side's not going away. The pressure from America, for example, just never let up. I emphasize the UN dimension because it's of crucial importance in understanding the main Jewish tragedy, I repeat, tragedy of the 1948 war. The screwball, hopefully, God willing, not fatal, borders of the state of Israel nowadays that you and I call the Green Line. These are the borders I told you before that President Obama and every other president, if Romney wins, he's going to do the same thing. They're committed officially that these are the borders of Israel. Just as shouldn't the, you know, the Palestinians should be peaceful and they shouldn't launch terrorist attacks and all that. But granted that, 
uh, Israel cannot hold on to Judea. Israel cannot hold on to the West Bank. You know that. Uh, Israel itself is not even trying to take over uh, the Gaza Strip. And uh, where did that all come be? How did these borders come to be? 48 war was, uh, you know, a uh, real guerra interruptus. You know, it was really a war that was not, it was, it was constantly interrupted. It was not permitted to play itself out the way wars usually do. Wars, especially the ones that end up clearing the air, are ones in which one side or the, one side or the other wins uh, completely, uh, decisively. One thinks, for example, of World War II and uh, Roosevelt's famous slogan, unconditional surrender, which some people criticize at the time, but he was absolutely correct. One thinks of General MacArthur taking the complete and total surrender of the Japanese, that famous picture in Tokyo Bay on the ship. What was the point of all that? This led to a healthy climate in Germany and Japan after the Second World War was over. They said, look, we lost. Fartig. Now let's move on. And what's the best way we can, we can proceed in this situation? And the U.S., as you know, gave a ton of money. We built up Germany and Japan, did, did we not? And uh, the idea was, okay, we fought, you lost, you admit you lost, and now we can move on and create a better climate. Germany lost some territory and Japan lost this, but out of the whole thing emerged two very strong and healthy democracies. Uh, by contrast, in the case of the 48 war, what happened was, like, was this. Israel was attacked by five armies. That's Egypt and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq, which are rather small and not well ar armed. I repeat, the total number of the Arab armies that invaded Israel in May 15th of 48, thank God, were not large. And were not very well armed either. The problem with Israel was that they hadn't been allowed to arm and organize themselves until May 14th, 1948, until the day the Arabs attacked. As long as the British were there, they were stopping them from getting weapons and putting together an army, all the rest of it. The fighting that we talked about, where they, the Palmach, for example, captured Tzfas or you know, Yafo, that sort of thing, they were going to take Yafo, those were done in spite of super obstacles imposed on the Jews um, in terms of weapons, and uh, ability to fight them, you know this. You go to Israel, those secret bullet factories and that kind of thing still had to be secret um, down to May or certainly down to April of 48. As a matter of fact, the Jews could not go on the offensive, if you recall, until April really of 48 when the British really had nine out of 10 toes out. Until then, Ben Gurion and the others, and I'm not saying they're wrong, were really afraid if we put our guys out in the front, the British will simply come and take all the weapons away, literally. And, uh, you know, where's that going to leave us? At the mercy of the Arabs. So time and little details matter so much in the story, unfortunately. Until May 14th of 48, uh, the Jews were not really allowed to arm and organize themselves. So from May to September, uh, May, June, July, August, September, during those months, Israel had to pay catch, play catch up even as they fought. They had to catch up with the military and, and, and organization side. It was during May, June, and July, and August that Israel made its numerous military blunders. Right? Ben-Gurion made some terrible mistakes, especially on the Jerusalem front, uh, which cost a lot of lives and, and got Israel nothing was negative um, during those months because they weren't organized right and they were just taking you know the story they taking people right off the boat who didn't know anything and giving them weapons and they got killed one two three i mean that's not the way to operate you can't say well i have no choice after that not if it's not going to work so all the mistakes were made then and by the way there's no such thing as an army that doesn't make a lot of mistakes before it gets it right they had to go through a period of learning what, what to do right and what's wrong but remember those months may june july august september by uh, by september and certainly by October, Israel had caught up. It got an attack together. It organized a real army. It got real weapons from Czechoslovakia. It mobilized many tens of thousands. By October, Israel decisively outnumbered the Arabs. Many people don't know this. That's simply because the Israelis did a better job of organizing their population. They put a real draft, and they really made it work, even though there were still plenty of draft dodgers, as you can tell from the films from that time. But with all that, they put into the field 90,000 men. The Arabs altogether had 50, maybe 55,000 men. So the Jews strongly outnumbered the Arabs by September of 48, which means, well, what do you think it means? They could have won on a military basis without any question. Um, I mean, Tzahal seriously outnumbered them. If the war would have been a regular war, Israel could have done in 48 what you and I know they did in 67, which is one, two, three in a few days, taking over the whole country. 
right? Think of the following fact, as I'll be speaking about in a minute. Here's the Jordanian army, the Arab Legion, holding the West Bank, as we call it today, as they call it, in 48. How big is the entire Arab Legion? 8,000 men, 7,500. 7,500. They don't have any airplanes, and the Jews have airplanes. They don't have any tanks, and the Jews have tanks. They don't have any big artillery, and the Jews, by September, October, started to get big artillery. You tell me who's going to win. It's not even a contest. Of course, if they would take over the West Bank, there's the problem of the very large Palestinian population. But the top is really general, and there's no question that Yigal alone was the most successful and impressive by far, is really general in the 48 war. A lot of these generals were bad, they made a lot of mistakes, they were no good. Again, that's what happens in the history of beginning of countries when they begin. If you know anything at all, for example, about the American Revolution, the majority of American gen generals were real boobs. And George Washington was not that great either when it gets down to being a, a general. It, 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 this is what happens. So Israel was lucky that they had a guy like, like Alone, and he was confident that he could kick out all the Arabs across the river into the kingdom of Jordan. You understand what I'm saying? He said, you leave it to me, we will take over, we will physically conquer what we call the West Bank, and we will drive, he says, I will do it. We will, we will compel all the Arabs to go into Jordan. And he had done this in April and May of 48 in the Eastern Galilee, if anybody recalls that from last year. Uh, this is Yigal Alain I'm talking about, who was the commander of the Palmach. And in April and May, uh, before, just, before, just, just before Israel became a state, they had all this fighting up in the north, I'm talking about in the area of Tiveria and Sfat. So that's the eastern side of the Galil, the one facing Jordan. And uh, although the Jews were outnumbered, etc., but he, as I said, he was a very good general. And um, they totally defeated all the Arab forces in the eastern Galilee, plus they expelled all these Arabs, uh, alone did, into uh, Jordan and into Syria, and some into Lebanon. It's very interesting, Yigal Alon was, was the only general born in Israel. He grew up among the Arabs in the Galil, and therefore he understood that it's not possible to have any peace with them. That's a f funny thing. He says, you, Ben Gurion, these other guys, you have dreams. You don't know what the reality is. I know what the reality is, and it's, you know, war is rough. He burned whole villages, destroyed entire uh, settlements. I'm not talking about killing people. I'm saying you kick the people and then destroy all the areas and all the Arabs witnessed this from the other side of the Jordan because you know and I know when you go up to that area you can see cross into Jordan and they, guess what they can see into Israel and uh, this is what he did he says I will do the same thing in the entire West Bank but what he didn't understand was the political side he was speaking as a military general from the professional military aspect and uh, the international climate by then was definitely opposed to expelling Arabs after May um, as I said before, once the state of Israel became a state, and once Bernadotte and these other guys got in there, then it became politically incorrect. You understand? Now, it didn't do any good for Israel to say, hey, they want to kick us into the sea, so why can't I kick them, why can't I kick them across the, the river? But that doesn't work anymore after May of 48. Um, and he didn't get it, and Ben-Gurion did, and this is a major reason why they hesitated very much to, uh, what shall I say, uh, go and take over the West Bank, even though they could. Bernadotte, Count Bernadotte, had demanded the return of the expelled Palestinians, I told you, right away, in, in, in May. And the demand did not go away. So Ben-Gurion, therefore, and Moshe Sharet were both afraid to expel. Um, remember, Israel, in 1948, was the darling of the liberals. The main supporters in the world of Israel in 1948 were the left, not the right. And they saw Israel as a uh, completely democratic and very tolerant kind of state. And they didn't understand, as, as hardly anyone did, the ethnic dynamic, as, which could only be understood by somebody on the spot. And uh, you know, to them, the, the Arabs were friends of the Nazis because the Mufti had been there and so forth. Israel are the good guys. And Israel was telling everybody, he said, we're the best friends of the Arabs, really. We're going to free them from their feudal oppressors, the landlords, and the other things like that. And in this kind of context, um, they couldn't go and do the cruel, that's what war is, the cruel task of kicking everybody out so that the land would then be only Jewish and they'd be able to hold it out militarily. And without expulsion, the West Bank, as we know, 
uh, this is the issue we struggle with today, although conquerable from the military point of view, is not doable demographically. Is this not Israel's existential problem today? You know, what do we, we, we do with the population? And the Arabs know this, by the way. Moreover, King Abdullah of Jordan was a very clever guy who understood clearly that he was a lot weaker militarily than Israel was. I told you, just look at the numbers. His whole army was 7,500 men. His goal, therefore, was not to conquer Israel, but to obtain as much Palestinian territory allowed under the partition plan as much as possible. There was a short period of a day or two in 48 when he, when he got confident and he said, oh, we're going to conquer Tel Aviv, which he would like to do. But very quickly he realized that's crazy and it's not possible with his tiny army and he's glad to hold on to whatever he can. And so uh, he played a shrewd game, I'm sorry to say. There's Abdullah. Um, and let me explain what I mean, because the geography tells you everything. Here, as you see, is the area allotted to the Arabs under the partition plan. Uh, the Israelis are already fighting to take over Jerusalem. In May of 48, the Jews had already conquered this area. That's what the operations of General Alon, as I told you before. They're expanding here. Uh, the Jordanians came in to save all this for the Arabs, not to take this, because they knew they're not strong enough to do that. He wants to, if it's up to, um, to King Abdullah, he would like to have all the area over here assigned for the Arabs. That was his dream. Of course, he had a real dream. He would like to take over the whole Middle East, if you know who he was, because the Hashemite dynasty back before the First World War had such ideas back in Lawrence of Arabia's time. But in practical terms, he wanted to get as much of this land as he can. On May 15th, 48, uh, the Jordanian uh, Arab Legion crossed the Jordan River and occupied much of the West Bank to the cheers of the Arab Palestinian population, the crowds who were scared that the Israelis were going to come in and invade and expel, which they were going to do. Uh, Abdullah succeeded in occupying all the areas of what we call the West Bank, or, you know, as I just pointed out to you, the land accorded to the Arabs under the partition plan, which is actually bigger than the West Bank is today. The one big problem in the Arab zone, because after all, this is all Arab land, so, you know, how are the Jews going to stop and the local people don't want the Jews in there? Here's the one problem. Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, which as you know, uh, is smack in the middle of the Arab zone and had 100,000 Jews. The Jews were um, the majority population over there. And this is a bone stuck in the Arab throat. And where is it going? That's why all the fighting with Jordan in 48 was in Jerusalem. This was actually a very poor military strategy, as, uh, as this guy pointed out. Yigal Yadin was the chief of staff of the Israeli, the functional chief of staff of the Israeli army. Um, but Ben Gurion insisted. Uh, now, Yadin was as close as you get to a professional soldier in Israel at that time. Ben Gurion wasn't, but the problem is Ben Gurion considered himself a soldier, and I'll explain what I mean. Here was, uh, here's the Israeli part. Here's the Jordanians coming in there. They have 7,500 men to hold this whole area. Ben-Gurion says, oh, you have to break through over here and get into Jerusalem. There are 100,000 Jews there. This is going to be the future capital of Jewish people. If you let Abdullah take it, it's going to be a Jordanian city, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, we have to send in men. And you know what I'm pointing to right now. This is the Baba Wad, all those, mount, uh, those hilly areas that the Jews had to send the convoys through. They got shot up. You, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And Ben-Gurion says, send in more, build a Burma road around the... Uh, the uh, Arab uh, blockade so we can get supplies in Jerusalem. You got your din, so I guess, forget all this. Go here. You see what I'm saying? If you go and take over this area, which they have so, the Jordanians with the 8,000 men, 75,000 men, have so many men c committed to this area. We have so many, go, here's Tel Aviv, just go like this and then go down. If you go over here, you cut them off at the Allenby River from their supplies and you can wipe out the, the Arab Legion. Ben Gurion said, well, what'll happen to Yerushalayim? And, you know, they're going to grab this. And Yadin said, no, you should go around like this. And they had these fights. And Ben Gurion said, I guess, I'm the boss and this is what you have to do. And as they say before, this was a mistake. Uh, people can disagree over this. You know, they're wrong, but they could disagree over this. And the result is, the result is, as we know, that the Jews didn't even try to take over this area seriously. They just tried to hold on to this strip that, as you and I know, will end up being a finger of Israel pointed to half of Yerushalayim. Actually, under the UN, under the partition plan that was voted in November of 47, Jerusalem was supposed to be an independent city. It didn't belong neither to Israel nor to the uh, Arab state. It was supposed to be governed by the UN. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine 
if Israel was governed by a mayor and a commission appointed by the United Nations today. But the UN, in November to May, never appointed anybody. They didn't take any steps to implement this. They just left the Jews and the Arabs to fight it out. Again, ever since the beginning of December of 47, it's supposed to be that the United Nations is going to send somebody to organize the government and the peaceful government of the city of Jerusalem as a separate zone. But the British were still there in, in December of 47. The British were still there in January, February, March, April, May. And the British said, as long as we're here, we're not going to cooperate. They said, let the whole place go to hell because they wanted to show the world, I explained this, excuse me, last year, that see, without us, nothing can, ha can get along. It'll be a chaos. We want the Jews and the Arabs to beg us to stay. That didn't happen. So the byproduct is, Yerushalayim was literally a half Hefkeris. And Yerushalayim basically therefore fell into two zones. The Jewish part was under the Jews, with the Haganah doing all the fighting over there. And the Arab part, what do you do with that? Until the British left, it was the Palestinians. But it was clear, as I told you, that the minute the British leave, the Palestinians are too weak. They're not going to be able to hold on to anything. As a matter of fact, in the last weeks before the British left, even the Jews, the Haganah, took over Katamon and some other uh, Arab neighborhoods that the Arabs, by the way, are still claiming down till today. They say this was the Arab part of Jerusalem and Israel has to give it back. Okay. And there was no question that if the Arab Legion hadn't moved in immediately in May 15th, straight over here, um, then the Haganah was going to capture the whole city, and they did come that close. This is one of those things you read in, in Tisha B'Av time in the nine days, when you find out how close Israel was to taking over the whole business. But uh, what can I tell you? The world was committed to an internationalization program, which, by the way, is a Christian thing. Is that correct? The Jews are not interested in the internationalization of Jerusalem. The Arabs are not interested. The Muslims of the world aren't interested in an internationalization of Jerusalem. The Jews say the whole city should be part of Judaism. The Muslims, of course, say it's the holy city of Islam. It's the Pope. <laughs> it's the other Christian groups that say it should not be under this group. It should be under, they can't say it should be under the Christians because the Christians don't have any foothold there. Therefore, you have to say it should be international, a, a, a place of peace for everybody. Uh, oh, seriously, can you imagine today Yushalayim, which has enough trouble even under the current government, okay? Yerushalayim has enough, there's enough there to make wars among the Jews, as we know, let alone with the Jews and the Arabs. And there would be somebody from the United Nations appointed by Libya or Faisal uh, to be in charge over there. That would really be a, a, a game. But anyway, the fighting between the Jordanians and the Israelis in 48 ended not bad for Abdullah. By that I mean that the Israelis were not successful in taking over the whole city, as you know. Moreover, the Israelis didn't even try to take over all this area over here in the West Bank that he had occupied. Abdullah was smart. He saw the uh, balance of power. He realized uh, that the odds are very much against him. And therefore, he wanted to stop the war right then because he had gained the maximum possible. He said, I'm done. I took over what I want. We're, we're done. Let's make peace or armistice or something like that. In spite of that, the so-called Arab street forced him to join the second round of fighting in July. In other words, I'll recall for you very briefly the sequence of events. In May 14th, Israel proclaimed the state. Uh, May 15th, they're invaded by the Arabs. And for the next uh, three weeks is a war. And then the United Nations, Bernadotte, forced both sides, or he pressured both sides, to agree to a ceasefire, which started on June 10th. So it's less than a month, right? Israel became a state on May 14th, and already before June 14th, already on June 10th, was a UN ceasefire for one month. For a month. Uh, it was supposed to be that neither side would arm during that month, but of course they did. And that means that on July 10th, the ceasefire is over. Already during that month, the UN and uh, the British and the others were pressuring both sides to uh, keep the ceasefire up. After all, Israel was very small. And in, in June, uh, they were having a tough time. They didn't have any of this. They would have lost all the Negev. They didn't have any of this. So really, what you see over here, this and this, which is small, that was the totality of Medinat Israel. And that's what the British wanted. That's what the enemies of the Jews wanted. Let it be a tiny state, not viable, with impossible borders and all the rest of it. And they tried to persuade the Arabs. Habseichel realized that you have a good thing going for you. But the Arabs could not do that. The uh, moms on the street 
were so heated up for a war, they couldn't believe, uh, they believed their own propaganda, they couldn't believe their armies hadn't wiped out the Jews, it must only be because of some special um, protection that the Americans, the British are giving them, which is all a lie, of course, and therefore they said, as soon as the ceasefire is over, we have to resume the fighting. And Egypt and Jordan, all these countries had to do it. Abdullah didn't want to do it at all. He said it's crazy. But the mobs were carrying on in the streets, so he had no choice. Against his will, he joined the second round of fighting. What happened is that it's supposed to end on July 10th, but both sides are ready a day or two before. And Israel launched a series of offensives to add some territory. And uh, that's when, so, so, so the second round of fighting took place 10 days, July 8th to July 18th. The Israelis started winning right away. For example, they captured Lud and Ramla, which are two Arab towns, and they kicked the Arabs out. This is all a famous thing. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin was the commander, and they just told all the Arabs, you guys are out of here. And there's a question, did they shoot anybody or not? Um, these were territories that King Abdul was banging his head. He says, you idiots, if we hadn't had a second round of fighting, this is an area that we already had won. All we're doing is losing. Same thing up here, the Israeli general, the other guy, Moshe Carmel, who was the other good general of Israel in the war, was taking over this area, conquering the uh, other side of the Galil, Nazareth and places like that. And um, once again, the Arabs were losing, losing. Because it was clear instantly from July 8th and 9th that Israel is winning and not losing, immediately Count Bernadotte in the United Nations said, the fighting has to stop now. You understand? On July 9th already, July 10th, they said, whoever doesn't stop the fighting will be sanctioned. And Israel could only postpone it by 10 days. In other words, it took a couple of days for the Arabs to realize what's going on. It took, uh, Abdul understood right away, but the Egyptians and the others didn't understand. The reason they didn't understand is because, you know how the Arab world works, the generals won't tell the truth if they're losing. This was a big plus for Israel. So for a few days, a few days, the Egyptians really believe that they're winning. The Syrians and the others still believe that they're winning. If you're winning, you don't want to stop. After a week or so, it was clear that this is going the wrong way, and so they said, okay, we've got to end it. But you understand the circumstances. This is what I mean by an, interrupt, uh, interrupt, an interrupted war. Israel was on a roll, but then they had to stop, not because of the military situation, but in spite of the military situation. The sad part is that although the Israelis did take Ramla and Lud, they failed, again, in the number of blunders to capture the old city of Yerushalayim, which should have happened, but didn't. The very minute the fighting started, I told you, the, the UN got in there, uh, oh my goodness, the British and the others demanded Israel withdraw from the territories that they took in the second round of fighting. Sharet was really scared. I don't blame him. You know, Israel was very weak at that time. He said, let's withdraw. Ben-Gurion said no, and they didn't. Um, Abdullah was pretty darn angry over the whole thing. After the fighting stopped on July 18th, Abdullah said like this, I'm not making this mistake ever again. I don't care what the crowds in the streets say. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this is a sad fact. He was clever. And he said, for now, we're not going to fight Israel. We have a ceasefire. The United Nations is against any renewal of the fighting. Shine. You know, we have what we have, which is the whole of the West Bank. You understand? We have a situation, as you know, the Israel over here, when it comes to Nari and all this, is not really an accurate map. It's, it's much narrower over here. In some places, nine miles. I know you know that. Uh, that's pretty good. Let's hold on to all this sort of thing. And Abdullah basically said, we're not going to get involved in the war. Instead, he concentrated very cleverly on consolidating his hold on the West Bank, displacing his hated foe, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. There you go. Um, the Mufti, of course, was the leader of the Palestinians. The Mufti was the guy who was the buddy of Hitler. Abdullah was the buddy of the British. Now, that for opportunistic reasons, but nevertheless, he was the buddy of the British. These guys hated each other more than the, uh, well, let's put it this way. Abdullah hated him more than he hated Israel, by far. I mean, he said so. It's not a secret. He said, I hate this guy more than I hate Israel, uh, which is one of the reasons that he eventually got him killed. This is the Middle East, my friends. Uh, it's true. Now, wait a second. Who is the leader of the Palestinians? Well, he's the leader of the Palestinians. Uh, what happened to the Palestinian state? It didn't happen. What happened to it? He immediately, as soon as the fighting was over, said, I guess, I'm going to be the leader of the Palestinians. Now, he's not a Palestinian. He said, yes, I am. My army is the one that saved them. Jordan is adjacent to Palestine. I'm the only one that can rely on it. I'm the smartest guy anyway, et cetera, et cetera. And he used his political and military uh, influence to um, have what they call the Jericho Congress, all the, uh, the delegates. Um, he handpicked them you know, from the different Arab tribes uh, and different Arab groups among the Palestinians 
got together and they declared him to be the king of Palestine. You see, and that's what happened. And Jordan, ever since then, has claimed to be, until recently, has claimed to be Jordan plus uh, Palestine. They, they changed their name. They used to be Transjordan was the name of the country. And it says not Transjordan anymore because not only the territory on the other side of Jordan, now it's called Jordan. As you know, the whole world calls them uh, Jordan. The uh, Palestinians, to this day, are very bitter over this. They said he stifled the Palestinian state in 1948, which is true. And uh, that was good for Israel as far as the Palestinian issue is concerned. But Israel, I'm talking in a larger uh, issue, which is the issue of the borders. I go into such detail over here because these events determined Israel's final borders on the so-called West Bank. These borders were not thought out. They did not reflect any kind of natural frontier. We're not talking about a river or a valley or a mountain or something like that. Uh, they simply happened to be where the fighting ended on July 18th, 1948. If on that date Tahal was holding half a village, then half the village ended up in Israel and half in Jordan, which is nuts. That's not the way you do it. But we've only just begun. It gets more complicated. After the fighting stopped on July 18th, uh, Bernadotte made a full court press to force Israel to return the Palestinians, return the land just captured, give Jerusalem, which is supposed to be an international city, and had a majority Jewish population, Bernadotte, as, in his capacity as the United Nations uh, mediator, said, I have a great idea. Give Jerusalem to Abdullah to be the capital of Jordan. And finally, to agree on the following swap. Uh, let me see. Yeah, on the following swap. Israel, he said, let's see now. This should go to Abdullah. See what I'm pointing up here, the Western Galilee, which Israel under General Carmel had just captured? Israel can keep this, but they should give up all of this, right? They can keep this part, but they should give up the Negev, the whole of the Negev. The Negev should go to Abdullah. Um, interesting concepts of mediation. The answer, of course, is the Count Bernadotte, for certain reasons, was very pro-British. He was very scared of Russia. Uh, he wanted to facilitate the British in their uh, policies. He thought he's doing a uh, favor to, the, you know, to everybody in, in, in general. And if Israel loses land, the heck with it. The point is that he was anti-Israel and pro-British, and therefore pro-German. And uh, in this environment, he was looked as a hero by the world, uh, a prince of peace. He was backed by the British Foreign Office. He was backed by the State Department of General Marshall, because that's who the Secretary of that State was at that time. He was backed by the liberal press around the world, because they thought, this is the man bringing peace to a war-torn land. You know how it goes. There was a good chance that Israel's part of Palestine would be shrunk, that they lose the Negev, as I said before. There was, simply, there was uh, certainly no chance that Israel could expand in this environment, which is why, on September 17th, Bernadotte was shot by the Stern Gang. Okay? This is, this is why they did it. Now, I'm not saying it's a good idea to assassination, but this is the historical reason why it happened. At that point, it's very interesting. The world was shocked and agog. Israel had to demonstrate that uh, you know, they hadn't done it. Ben-Gurion responded in his way by cracking down in the sense of arresting the assassins who were arrested, but it was a joke because the assassins were given light sentences and soon released which has made Sweden anti-Israel ever since. And I don't blame them from their point of view. Understand? But what happened was they arrested the Stern Gang guys, and the Stern Gang said to Ben-Gurion, so you want a civil war? We'll bring this into the state. Let's have a policy. You kill me, I kill you. We're ready to do that. And um, Moshe Shua and the others said, let's not get that. We have enough trouble fighting the Arabs. We don't need uh, a civil war among the Jews. And uh, you know, with the, with the Jewish terrorism and all the rest of it. And so they said, listen, you know, while the world's watching, We'll give them a sentence, and later on, about a year later, they let them all go. One of them was elected to the first Knesset, by the way, one of the assassins of Bernadotte. Israel is an interesting country. Anyway, he cracked down, though, in general, on the Stern Gang and on the Irgun, who had nothing to do with it, and uh, you know, broke, broke them uh, apart and disbanded their armies and all the rest of it, thereby impressing world opinion and indicating, in effect, as the Bible puts it, Yadenu lo shafku as Adam Israel. We didn't, we're, we're not responsible for the killing, killing of Bernadotte. Um, but at the same time, Ben Gurion, who was a realist, said, uh, now that he's out of the way, let's at least use this opportunity to take this. You see what I'm pointing over here? What we call today Judea. There's Hebron, for example. Beislacham, Hebron, that area. Let's at least take that, because this area was not held at that particular time by Abdullah. 
This land in the south of Jerusalem was held by the Egyptians. The Egyptians had taken a line such as I'm drawing over here, Jerusalem to the south from the Mediterranean south. This is where the battle lines were doing. And Ben-Gurion said like this, uh, while the world's all agog and all the rest of it, um, we can, uh, and the Egyptians have no right to be here. They're definitely a foreign country. Maybe Abdullah can claim to be the king of the Palestinians because in an adjacent country and the people in Jordan are sort of like the Palestinians anyway, et cetera, et cetera. But what has the Egyptians got to do with anything? And he said, let's move and do it. Uh, the rest of the cabinet voted against it. They overruled Ben-Gurion. They feared in the aftermath of the assassination, the UN will condemn and sanction Israel. Ben-Gurion said, this is a bechiel adorot, as he put it. This is something you'll be crying around for generations. So it's an opportunity. This was the opportunity to take Hebron. Those of you who have been in Hebron, you know what I'm talking about. Could have been part of Israel in 48. Um, but you have to understand also the um, feelings of Sharet and the, the Mizrahi and the Agoda and the General Zionists, all of whose, which I totally understand. We said, listen, Israel's a baby. It's fragile. We can't afford to take on the world. We're glad that we got even half, half a loaf. We, it's an unbelievable miracle that they got to be in Israel altogether. Uh, we, we don't take uh, imprudent steps. And you know, Ben Gurion saw it differently, but that's what happened, so it didn't happen. In October, November, December of that year, fearing that Egypt would get the negative by default because you saw what Bernadotte was talking about and many others had all kind of plans that the entire negative area should go to Abdullah or to Egypt. And being scared of this, Israel fought Egypt. Israel did not fight Jordan. All the fighting in, in, this, in the last part of the year, October, November, December, is here in this area, in the northern Negev, right? And uh, they defeated them in the northern Negev. They invaded Sinai. They had a clear shot at the conquering the Gaza Strip. This we talked about uh, last year. This was the final, uh, nearly final uh, episodes of the Israeli 48 war. Uh, the Egyptian army was over here. Uh, without making a long, to make a long story short, the Israelis made an end run like I just did over here. They didn't know they were coming and they came up this way. And if they wanted to, they could have captured El Arish. But the British threatened them and they had to pull out. And even when they pulled out, so if you come back to Israel, to uh, Palestine proper, look what I'm doing. You cross the border over here. Here's the Gaza Strip. They said, we can cut off the entire Egyptian army, which they could over there, and conquer the Gaza Strip in uh, January of 49. Yigalon and Yitzhak Rabin were the uh, commanders over there, and they were begging, just give us the permission. Give us a few days. But unfortunately, my friends, we're talking about, we're talking about um, after November 4th, 1948. So the election was over in America. And so the State Department uh, didn't have to play nice. And so what happened was, at that point, our two friends over here again, uh, the heads of the, uh, the, the, the bureaucrats in charge of the foreign ministries, they said, um, if Israel takes the Gaza Strip, uh, we will uh, either go to war with them or we'll cut off all aid for them, we'll do something very bad to them. Um, Truman sent a famous letter to Ben-Gurion in which he said we'll have to reassess our relationship with uh, Israel. There is a famous uh, American ambassador, James McDonald, who was a great friend of Israel and was a great friend of the Jewish people. But he's an ambassador, so he has to deliver the message. He goes to see Ben-Gurion in January of 49. Ben-Gurion's not in Jerusalem, he's up in Tiveria. And McDonald said, I'll drive to Tiveria. And they go over there and it's, here's a letter from Truman, you have to pull out. And Ben-Gurion on this occasion uh, although, if you ask me, I know, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I don't think you really had to listen to this, but he did. And he said, oh, we're pulling out. And um, alone, as, we begged him. And he said, you know, just give me a day or two or three and uh, just stall them. And we can, Mamish have now the, the opportunity because we're in the heights above Rafiach. We can conquer the whole Gaza Strip. And I will drive the Arabs out of there. You see? Well, this will be a sewer for Israel. Boy, was he right. And this way it won't be. And Ben-Gurion says, you have to leave now. You see? Um, it's also true that at this very point, Egypt, when all else fails, said, OK, if Israel doesn't go into the Gaza Strip, then we agree to negotiate an armistice with them. And Moshe Sharat and the others, and Ben-Gurion also said, wow, we have a chance for an actual peace treaty with an Arab country. Wow, this is worth almost anything. Now, they were wrong about that. At least that's my thesis. But that's what they thought because um, Israel should have conquered the Gaza Strip and they said, now let's talk, but that's not what they did. Uh, Ben-Gurion and Sharet really were so dazzled by the prospect they might get a genuine peace treaty with Egypt that they agreed to stop the fighting, losing Israel's sole chance, as I told you before, of taking over the Gaza Strip and, and expelling the people there. The result was the armistice signed in Rhodes 
which left the Gaza Strip in the hands of Egypt. As you know, this was the great achievement that got Ralph Bunch the, um, the uh, Nobel Prize, but it cost Israel the Gaza Strip. And I think everybody in the world today, besides the Arabs, sees what a problem it is. Just, I mean, it's really sad, if you can imagine Israel, in which Gaza was part of Israel. We don't have all that. It's, it's just sad even to think about it. And by the way, where is that going? It's a million people now. It's two million people tomorrow. It's three million people. You can't keep three million people in the Gaza Strip. You understand? These are not little issues over here. These are existential ones. Anyway, the result was that uh, you had the armistice that was signed in Rhodes. Uh, ben Gurion figured. Let's go back here for a second. Yeah, Ben Gurion figured. Okay, we won't take the Gaza Strip, but we get the Southern Negev. Uh, this was up for a debate. Uh, the, even when they signed the armistice, it wasn't clear what's going to happen. And the Israeli army went and occupied all the way down to uh, Eilat. They said, oh, look, we got the Negev. So they figured like this, yeah, we lost the Gaza Strip. That's a bummer, but we got the Negev, and that's a big deal. And uh, we come out ahead of the game. And I totally understand that uh, kind of uh, thought, thinking, but uh, you know, it wasn't a good idea, as we all know. Um, and anyway, they decided to be optimistic about a real peace in the Middle East. It was understandable, totally understandable. Israel had been at war now for a long time. They, they, the people desperately wanted peace. But it was stupid in the Middle East, I'm sorry to say. Still, the Gaza Strip was an open wound. And as I, let's put it this way, ain't Suffolk motzi me with Devade, they say in the Gemara. Unfortunately, something that's a Suffolk, whether or not there'll be peace, can't remove or take you away from the fact that if the Arabs are in the Gaza Strip, it's going to be bad news for Israel. And that's what subsequent history has demonstrated. After the Egyptian-Israeli armistice agreement, Abdullah wanted to follow also. Why did he want to follow? I don't want Israel to invade the West Bank. This will at least nail down. He was well aware that Yigal alone could easily conquer the West Bank, which would be the easiest thing in the world. I mean, after all, the, the Arabs, the Arab Legion, wasn't big enough to, 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 to hold even the area that was assigned to them, that they had taken over, it was only, so to speak, by the restraint of Israel that they were able to hold on to, the, to their whole area. I would say even furthermore, I'm going to tell you even more. Look what I'm doing with my pointer right now. This area itself, only this area, was held by the Arab Legion. This area, north of it, was held by the Iraqi army. This area, south of it, was held by the Egyptian army. What happened was that both the Iraqis and the Egyptians, for various reasons, pulled out. At that point, Abdullah said, I'm going to send my men in there. If you have 8,000 men to cover the whole front that had been held by three armies, it's a joke to take it over. Israel could do it instantly. You understand? The, the, Abdullah was never desperate uh, to get the Israelis to commit themselves to leave all the territory in his hands. He invited Ben-Gurion and other Israelis to come to Jordan to talk to him secretly to work out a deal. Ben-Gurion never would come, but he, all the others did. Uh, here are Israel's secret diplomats. Uh, Ruben Shiloh on the right. Uh, well, let's put it this way. They both spoke Arabic. Uh, this guy, you can tell by his name, was a Sephardi. He's from Damascus. Uh, a Jew, of course. Elio Sasson. And therefore, he grew up in, in our public school, so he understood the Arabs very well. At least he thought he did. This guy was born in Meisharim. Uh, Zaslansky. You know, you have to know me, how me. And his father was a Rosh Hashiva in Meisharim, but he became a secular Zionist, you know. But, but a servant of the Jewish people. And he was Ben-Gurion's top spy. He's the one who made the Mossad. He wasn't good at running it, but he organized it. And he was the one always having secret conferences with all these Arab leaders that they don't talk about till later. Abdullah was a slip. Yeah, here's Moshe Dayan meeting with the uh, Arab, the Jordanian, um, the Arab commander, which he did a lot also. Moshe Dayan was very much all the time going over to Abdullah's house, to his palace, to have these secret conferences and, and dinners and things like this. Abdullah was a slippery customer. He tried to get all he could. Give me back Lud. Give me back Ramla. And I also want Katamun. And I also want the Negev. Imagine that. He had this chutzpah because he had a big brother who was on his side. Right? The British totally backed him, Ernest Bevan. Israel, countering this, this would happen at all these secret parties and these dinners. Israel made military threats. If you don't give in, we'll attack you. They moved the army brigades around here and there very publicly. And uh, so Abdullah had to back off. 
Israel eventually extracted from Abdullah tiny territorial concessions, which helped territorially, but hurt demographically, and resulted in an even crazier border. Here I have the one piece tonight, if you'll pay attention to this, of audiovisual. Pay close attention. Meanwhile, the Jordanian negotiations continued. Borders were marked out in the Jerusalem area. Some thought the talks would fail. King Abdullah kept the delegation talking in Rhodes, but decided to conduct the substantive negotiations himself in Transjordan. We received a message from the King of Jordan, King Abdullah, the grandfather of the present king, that um, he wanted to negotiate the um, basic terms of the armistice in person. In other words, he did not rely on his delegation in uh, Rhodes to negotiate the details of the agreement, and we de de decided everything directly with him, uh, and the, the, the decisions were then communicated to the delegations in Rhodes. Talks resulted in significant border corrections. Israel got Wadi Ara in the north, including a series of Arab villages where Iraqi troops had occupied the hills. Wadi Ara provided Israel more direct access between the coastal plain and the eastern Galilee. Ben-Gurion had wanted it desperately. In exchange, the Israelis gave up a small strip of land near Hebron. Another Israeli aim was to control the railroad that ran from the coast up to Jerusalem. Near Jerusalem, it went through the Arab village of Bet Safafa. King Abdullah agreed to give Israel the railroad and divide the village, expecting Israeli acquiescence in his own plans to annex the entire west bank of the Jordan. After the war, the situation of the Arabs was nowhere more bizarre than in this village of Beit Safafa, just south of Jerusalem. Under the armistice agreement, this railway and that part of the village to my right went to Israel, the village part to my left to Jordan. European railway carriages have a sign, do not lean out of the window. Israelis used to joke that carriages on this line had a sign, it's funny, but it's do not, not lean out of the window. I'll tell you what I mean. The resulting border was a nightmare. First of all, it was militarily indefensible, right? Because it's not based on any kind of natural borders, defensible areas. It's wherever it happened to be. Which is why Israel, from day one, has had to train an offensive army. Isn't that right? They can't afford a defensive battle when you have such a narrow uh, territory. That's first of all. Oops. This map is not even so accurate because it makes it look like it's wide over here. In some of these areas, it's nine miles wide, so it's nothing, okay? So you can't have a defense in which, let's say the Iraqi army comes to Jordan and they come all tacked over here, they can break his own hand. Ever since 1948-49, Israel had no choice but to create an army with an offensive doctrine, so the instant war starts, like happened in 67, they go on the offensive. But then you have the problem that they're taking over Arab land, and the other countries in the world don't want to allow it, and you know, you get into that sort of thing. That's number one. Number two, the border uh, cuts through Arab villages and fields. Do you hear what I said? It cuts through villages, as you just saw in that piece, which meant that the Arab peasants could never really make peace with it. This result, I mean, here's my front lawn is in Israel. My house is in Jordan. I mean, nobody's ever going to agree to that permanently. This resulted in what the Israelis called infiltration, meaning the Arab guy wants to go into his land. This made life a nightmare for the Israelis, starting in 1948. If you want to get down to I'll talk about it. The infiltration by the Arabs starts in 48, not in 49 even, which led Israel to overreact by killing the peasant infiltrators. Ben-Gurion gave orders, anybody goes over the line, shoot him. Which means that you're an Arab infiltrator going to start arming themselves and killing Jews. Which means that these type of guys are going to have to develop a doctrine will, which says every time they kill one of us, you have to go in and blow up one of their villages and kill 20 of them. That's the only language they understand. Which leads to a poisonous chad gad yod. Do you not agree? Yeah. yeah. Violence just escalates. So it seemed like a clever ending of the war but was the opposite. And I ask you this question. Uh, and if they go back tomorrow to the green line, is, is that dynamic going to go away? It's not going to. As a matter of fact, what's happened now is Israel built a wall in the Sharon, as you all know. 
In 48, 49, they didn't want to build a wall, which would have worked. Why not? Because part of the psychology of the Israelis, the Ben-Gurion was, we don't have it today, we'll take it tomorrow. Once Israel gets long enough, we'll double the population, we'll build a big army, we'll take it tomorrow. He was just being totally, he was la la it was completely unrealistic. And Ben-Gurion did not understand the real facts of life until Eisenhower made him get out of Gaza and, and the Sinai in 56. 57. You understand? Notice it was until that point that it was completely unrealistic. Other Israelis continue today to think that they could take all this area and that area, but nobody's got to, as you know and I know, this is the number one problem we have. What do we do with all those Arabs? And it all goes back to this original sin of the crazy borders that I just described. We're really dealing over here in the realm of culture. Chaim Weizmann said very famously, you don't have to be crazy to be a Zionist, but it helps. He meant that in a humorous way. But I'll tell you what's really true, and that is, in order to be Zionists, the original settlers had to be unrealists. They had to create their own version of reality. I mean, they had to. I'm not saying this to be clever. They had to. Uh, they had to be fantasists. They had to create their own Arab reality. Because if they looked at the real Arab reality, it's an impossible situation. And why would anybody even start to get kibbutz in the middle of the Ghana or someplace, right in the middle of all these Arabs? You understand? Unless you create your own narrative, your own, your own uh, reality. You have to believe. You have to believe. This is how they did. The Arabs will really accept us once we show how good, how good we are, how it's in their interest to be friends with us. Um, the alternative is too awful to contemplate. And so it has to be that the Arabs don't like us because we represent a progressive force in the Middle East and the Arab landlords uh, resent the fact that Jews have labor unions and they raise the dignity of the workers, but really we're the best friends of the Arab peasants and all that. It's just one true. And certainly the Arabs did not see it that way. They saw the Jews as invaders and intruders, and just as they never gave up Israel, we're not going to give up. You, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about what you all know. Uh, the fact that Israel, the Egypt, agreed to negotiate under dire necessity at Armistice, the fact that Abdullah agreed to negotiate, invited them for secret dinners under the most dire necessity, led the Israeli belief, uh, leaders in 49 to believe that despite all the screaming in the Arab world about a second round, because the Arabs said, we lost the first round, but we're going to get ready for the second round, in spite of all the protestations against ever agreeing to that fate accompli, which the state of Israel uh, was, deep down they'll be pragmatists. Deep down they'll lead their pe peoples to a, strong, a lasting peace, which will make the Mideast look like the Midwest. <laughs> it's a nice dream. And if you can sell somebody, you know, it's a, and it's necessary to make such a speech if you have an Israel bond dinner in America, because that's what the people want to hear. It's necessary to make such a speech if you want to get uh, you know, uh, people outside to support you, that Israel believes in a better tomorrow. Abba Iban did it better than I can, as you know. But this was delusional. As we say, all, I think all sadly know and acknowledge, it was actually culturally condescending. True? I mean, you Arabs, you know, one day you'll see how much better it is with us. The one guy, by the way, back in the 1920s that did not go along with this Arab reality, interestingly, was a Jabotinsky, who has a famous essay where he said, don't, don't underestimate the Arabs, they're not dumb. And they don't like us. I don't blame them for not like If I was there, I wouldn't like us either. And they have an undying and many will not go away and just get used to it. And Israel, if it's going to exist, will have to exist with an iron wall around it. It's a famous speech he did uh, long ago. <sighs> so this set of attitudes, which said, we don't want to believe this. We want to believe in a better tomorrow. We want to believe in a world in which the Arabs will accept us. Uh, we want to believe in a world in which we'll get better borders tomorrow. What can I tell you? This all led the Jewish leaders to make terrible choices in 48 and 49, with which um, Israel leaves, uh, lives today. Uh, if you combine that with the optimistic feeling that, you know, the borders will change tomorrow, the opportunity will present itself for us to take it over, and the opportunity did in 1967. But the essential problematic did not go away. I'll just clue, conclude by saying that if you study closely the 67 war, not the 48 war, the 67 war, you got alone, and Moshe Dayan were in the Israeli cabinet. Moshe Dayan was the defense minister, and you got alone, uh, the deputy prime minister or something like that. Uh, you got alone was from a marginal figure. He, he didn't have so much power. He said, we're going to have the 67 war, the Tahal should kick everybody out, let the world scream, but then this, 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 we can do it. 
it was Moshe Dayan who said, by that time, he said, no, we can't do it anymore. And if you want to get the world to uh, acquiesce in an Israeli occupation of the West Bank, we have to make the case that we're liberal. I understand both sides of this. I do, just as you do. But I'm sorry to say that history has demonstrated to us that having a country is not a game. Having a country means you make radical choices. Um, Benny Mars, and with this I conclude, who I'm sure many of you know is a famous historian, who's the one who blew the whistle on Israel expelling the Palestinians to what degree they did in 1948 war, originally was one of what they called the new historians back in the 1980s. And he was writing about how Israel uh, did all these terrible things in expelling the Palestinians and all the rest of it. And oh, Arafat loved him and all the rest. I'm not saying he did it to be pro arafat he was just being a historian. But uh, the Arabs thought this is great, and he's quoted constantly all the rest of them, and, and so forth. In, in recent years, I, I read something about a year, two, three years ago, he said something which to me is elementary, but I guess some of us takes a while to catch up to the elementary facts. He said, you know, looking back, Israel made a mistake in not kicking out all the Arabs in 48. The reason he said it like this, if you kick out nobody, that's one thing. If you kick out everybody, that's one thing. If you kick out half and half, it's the worst of all because you're not going to get any credit, you're going to get an undying hatred, and whoever's staying behind is going to be your worst enemy. And I don't blame them being the worst enemy. So I start, with this I conclude that I uh, started, we've come to our, our close, I started by saying that we're going to deal with serious subjects, and it is serious subjects. And uh, these are not just matters of little details, these are little details that govern the fundamental is really problematic from the security point of view today. That's why I call them Israel's existential security threat. Um, where does this, how does this go away? Um, I think uh, as time proceeds, uh, all those who are Zionists are going to have to find themselves religious Zionists in order to find, a look, to, to discern a, a, uh, a ray of hope in the uh, situation because the Arabs don't look to me and they don't look to you like they're ever going to acquiesce in anything that I just talked about. And so you're back to the Jabotinsky, Israel has to live within an iron wall. Many Jews in Israel, I don't blame them, don't like to hear that. After all, my son is not in the Israeli army, but their son is. I totally get it. And uh, many people say, Halolam, Halanetzach, Teochal Cherev. Will the sword go on forever? Uh, the sad, honest fact is, looks like the sword will go on forever. I mean, I, you know, nobody knows what the future is, obviously, and all kinds of things are possible, especially in the Middle East. But you don't look for any kind of uh, Hollywood ending on this kind of phenomenon. I'm able to speak to you in this very direct way because I know you and know me, we, you know, and, and, and in this form we can do so. This is not necessarily a speech I'll give everywhere else, but let us at least walk away tonight, you know, uh, looking reality in the face, but remembering that we are Jews, and that means we always live with hope, and history has proved many times that that which seems impossible turns out to have surprising possibilities.